you have your Bibles, you can go with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. You know, there are many moments in life where we have to make our intentions known. We kind of have to declare our allegiances in various aspects of life, many moments of life. Uh, you know, whose side are you on? Maybe it's on the playground as kids. You guys, you guys have to te- choose a team, right? You get on one side or the other. In sports, certainly, it's like, okay, which team are you on? Uh, political parties, right? Friendships, uh, family matters. There's oftentimes this, like, where are your allegiances? And it's always interesting, isn't it, how people make that decision, right? Some people make decisions about allegiances when they kind of weigh the room and they're like, which side is going to win, <laughs> right? And like, I'm going to choose the winning team uh, to be on. Uh, that'll be my side that I choose. Uh, other times, it's like, this is where my loyalties are, or this is where it's right to stand, and so I'm going to stand over here. And uh, it's always interesting to think about those like making your intentions, your allegiances uh, known in life. Uh, Many of you who know me know I am a lifelong faithful Detroit Lions fan. And uh, you know, uh, some of you are laughing because you're like, yeah, you've been through many, many years of uh, like... uh, you shouldn't say that publicly, right? Um, and uh, I mean, back in 2008, we were 0 and 16, so it was like that, like, yeah, records to be broken right there. Uh, we got that record. Um, so you know, there's there's moments where it's like, you know, you're used to when I say I'm a Detroit Lions fan, I'm used to the mocking and the ridicule. And this year, even even this Friday, I was out uh, at Dunkin' Donuts and I had my Detroit Lions. Uh, uh, quarter zip on and they're like oh yeah go Lions and I'm like it still is a little bit of a shock to me this season where people are like good job go go Detroit and I'm just I am so not used to this Um, I don't know what that even feels like I'm still processing it um, as people kind of share some allegiance with me and I'm like whoa this is uh, not what I'm used to Uh, it's confusing to me uh, as people declare at least some sympathy maybe not allegiance but they declare some sympathy in, uh, in this regard, uh, today we are uh, celebrating Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Passion Week, we call it. It's the week leading up to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in our text today, we're actually at the dramatic end of Passion Week. We're going to get to the cross of Jesus Christ in our text today. And it's one of those, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, it's a fascinating thing for us to think about the gospel writers. Each one of the gospel writers do this. Each one of the gospel writers go into absolute slow motion mode when it comes to the Passion Week of Jesus. Matthew chapter 21 starts the Passion Week. Chapter 28, the end of Matthew, concludes the Passion Week of Christ. Uh, it's, it's about 30% of the book is found in one week of Jesus' life. I would, I would beg you to show me any biography of any person who has 30% of their biography that is filled up with one week of their life. We have that in the Gospels. Every writer goes into slow motion mode when it comes to the person, person of Jesus and when it particularly comes to this week we call the Passion Week. Matthew's Gospel, and we'll see this again today in our text, Matthew's gospel highlights Jesus as the king. He is the king. And and rather than just speaking in our text today about the details of the king's death and his crucifixion, rather than just walking through all those details, Matthew draws attention to the various people and their part in it, their perspective in it, their response to King Jesus through the details of the crucifixion. The author is helping us. We don't, he, does, he doesn't just want us to see the details of what's going on. He wants to see it through the eyes of and hear it through the lips of those who were there, or those who were acting out in this particular narrative. And so Matthew draws attention to those details through the various people in this text as they respond to King Jesus during the crucifixion. And and I believe that the author is doing that to help you and I see their perspective, but to ask the question of, well, where am I in this text? 
We're meant to see ourselves in this text as we see it through the eyes and hear it through the lips of those who were there. We're meant to consider, what do I say about him? What do I think about Jesus? How do I respond to Jesus as the king? There are three basic responses in our text today. There's mockery, there's curiosity, and then there's honor. There's those three responses uh, in this text. Let's read the opening section. We'll, we'll cover three different sections here on, on those three responses. But let's first look at Matthew 27, and we'll begin at verse 26. It says, Then he, this is speaking of Pilate, released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but he, when he had tasted it, he would not drink. And when they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up, their, put up over his head the accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, we'll let him deliver him now if, we, if he will have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. This text puts before us this opening section of mockery upon mockery upon mockery in the crucifixion of Jesus. And I want to draw, draw your attention. I, I told you, you know, Matthew kind of doesn't go into all the little details of the crucifixion. He goes through, helps us see through the perspective of these people who were there. Notice that even in verse 26, he's, it just says, when he had scourged Jesus, speaking of Pilate's treatment of Jesus, I just want to say here, like many people died during scourging. Scourging is a process where you tie the person to a pole, you take out a whip with multiple tails to it that have metal shards or, or bone chunks on the end of it, and you whip it upon this person, and then you yank it off, ripping the flesh and opening gashing wounds. Uh, you did it up to 39 times is, is what was done here in this process called scourging. The victim's back, their shoulders, their side were left ripped off, muscles and tendons and bones exposed. This is the details of what a scourging is. Much of their body would have looked like beaten, shredded meat. And in a few words, Matthew says, scourge, now let's keep moving. It's, it's, it's remarkable to me in some ways, the minor details about things that people die over and he skips over that and helps us again see it through the people and place ourselves on the scene through their eyes. And so I want to look at several mockers here and help you see what's going on in the text as Matthew emphasizes it. The first one here, this idea of, of mocking, where in, in this, uh, this thought of, I refuse to give my allegiance to him. This king, as it's highlighted throughout our text, 
I will not give my allegiance to him. In fact, he's the kind of king that we're to belittle or mock. That's the mindset we see in this opening section, first through the Roman garrison in these opening verses, 27 to 37. They look at Jesus and they say, hey, he's at least going to be good to us for a little sport here, right? And they surround him. They have a little sport over beating him and then they and mocking him. And then they raffle for his cloak. You know, it's an interesting study. We've, we've been here, if you've been with us, in Matthew. And I think it's an interesting study. It's really hit me this time through the Gospel of Matthew, this idea of who surrounds Jesus. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked his disciples, will you come near? Will you be around me and pray with me? And what do they do? They fall asleep and they quickly forsake him. At the end of chapter 26, Jesus is now, instead of surrounded by his friends praying for him, he's surrounded at the end, in chapter 26, near the end of it, he's surrounded by the chief priests and the temple guards, and they're beating him and spitting upon him. Here in our text, he's once again, he's surrounded by a whole garrison of Roman soldiers, and they're doing what? They're mocking him as the king. They've heard this title being used about Jesus, the king of the Jews. And so they're going to have some fun at Jesus' expense. They take off his garments and they put on him a robe that has royal color. And they do what? They take a crown of thorns. They take thorns from a Jerusalem thorn tree. And uh, they're still prevalent today. I was at the privilege of going there in 2014. And... I remember our guide, we're walking along, and he just says, here's a Jerusalem thorn tree, right? And it's right there uh, on the, uh, near the Garden of Gethsemane was one, but there's many around. If you don't want to see more decisively what they look like, on the top of our cross over here is a genuine thorn bush uh, cross over here, and you can see the one to three inch spikes on the, uh, the actual real uh, thorn over there, they shoved it down upon his head, mocking him as a king, stabbing him with thorns uh, that wouldn't have been around except for the fall of mankind, right? Uh, this is this I irony, and this whole section is ripe with irony. They also do what? They take a reed, a little stick, and they put it in his hand, mocking him like he has a royal scepter in his hand, royal robe, a crown, a scepter, and they kneel before him, and they mock him. Hail, king of the Jews. Irony upon irony, again, throughout this section. In Philippians 2, verse 10, what does it tell us about one day that every knee will do before the king of all kings, King Jesus? One day, every knee will bow in reverence to King Jesus. Here is a kneeling, mocking of this Jesus, right? If he was just Jesus, King of the Jews, it'd be one thing. But he is the King of all kings, God the Son. And if they knew that, right, they would respond differently, you would assume. Here they, they mock him. The second group of, of, of mockers here in this text is found in verse 38 through 40. And it's the, the people. Right? Crucifixion was a gruesome way to die. It was perfected by the Romans, and it was, it was bloody, it was gruesome, it was absolutely painful, and it would be prolonged, where there would be a, a, a person hanging there just outside the city, and it would be right along the pathway of people walking about living life. And it says in our text, that people were doing that. They were walking around and they came by Jesus and what did they do? They also joined in mocking him. People with a weak stomach likely wouldn't have gone near this kind of a display, but there were some who came and saw Jesus. Remember, he's put the context of this passage between two thieves. He's, he is uh, pictured with the guilty, Right? And it says here, they wagged their head in disgust against him. They taunt him by saying, you who destroy the temple and build it up in three days, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And again, we have irony upon irony, right? Precisely because he was the son of God, and it was the will of his father, 
to go to the cross. We just saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane. If, we were, if, we're, if we're reading the text, right? Precisely because he is the Son of God doing the Father's will, he's going to go to the cross and not run from it and not come down as they taunt him here. That he would give himself, his body willingly, his temple to be destroyed. And in three days, what is he going to do? He's going to rebuild it, just as he had said. So we see this mocking second group, not only the Roman garrison, but the people walking by, wagging their heads and taunting Jesus. And, and lastly, in this text, the mockers are filled out with the religious leaders here in verse 41 through 43. The chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people, the Pharisees, they've been scheming for years to take down Jesus and intensely now for a, a little bit. And they're finally, they've done it. Finally, they've accomplished what they've wanted to do. And so what do they do? They also come by to gloat, Right. They have seemingly won, and they're there to gloat. What do they say in verse 42 and 43? They say, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. They go on to say, if you really did show these, you came down and you were delivered, we would believe you, they mockingly say. And again, they draw attention to what title about Jesus? The title that he's the son of God. Again, there's irony upon irony throughout this text. Precisely because he is the Son of God, that he alone is the perfect substitute. No other substitute will do. All the Old Testament sacrifices, they wouldn't do, they wouldn't sustain in any longevity that our sins could be dealt with. What we have to do, we have to keep going back to sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Jesus, as the Son of God, was the perfect sacrifice for sinners to save them. The only way to save them was what? He had to give of himself. And so again, irony upon irony, he's at that moment trusting God that this is the only way. Remember, he prayed, if there's any other way in the garden, let this cup pass from me. This is the only way, the perfect Son of God as the perfect substitute for sinners. And, and just one more little add on verse 44. If we didn't get enough of the, the surround sound of mockery of Jesus, it just adds in verse 44, even the thieves next to Jesus, condemned as well, they're doing what? They jump in with the mockery. There's this surround sound of opposition Matthew is showing us through the eyes and the mouth of these various people that mockery upon mockery upon mockery is the response to the king. This chorus of voices mocking Jesus as the rightful king, all hurling insults against him. Now, let's just take a moment and say, perhaps this is us here in this text. We have to, we're supposed to look through this text and do we see ourselves in the text? Perhaps this can describe you. Certainly it describes many people today in our world that when they look at Jesus, he is not one to be respected. He's not one that we're to honor and give our lives to. He's what? He's one that's mockable. Jesus and people who de devote their life to following him are fools. Mockery is a key response to Jesus to this day. And in a certain level, in a certain level, I appreciate the honesty here. I appreciate this like, if Jesus is not the king of kings who he claimed to be, then I don't owe my allegiance to him at all. Why in the world would I give my life to follow him if he's not who he says he is? If he's not God the Son, then I don't owe my allegiance. I really don't even owe my respect to Jesus. And that's how many people with honesty treat him and mock him to this very day. Why waste your time with him? C.S. Lewis famously touched on this idea. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. Many people that like, I want to respect his teaching. He's a good example. All that is garbage 
if he is not really the king of all kings and lord of all lords, if that does not describe him, then he doesn't deserve your respect. He actually probably deserves your mockery. If he's not who he claimed to be, if he's not Lord, if he's not king of all kings. Let's look at the second group. Not only those who mocked, but secondly, those who were curious. Those who were curious. These are the uncommitted. These are who I wonder if Jesus will show us any more tricks up his sleeve. I wonder if he'll keep proving himself. Many people today, keep proving yourself to me. Keep showing me more and more and more. And I stand up here in judgment of you and keep showing me more and more details. Mockers will force entertainment out of the one. I'm going to force you to entertain me. These are kind of curious and uncommitted. Maybe there's more entertainment to be had here in this particular moment. We see it in verses 45 uh, to 53. Let's read that together. It says, Now the sixth hour, from the sixth hour, and until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, leave him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Here, this text opens with darkness. And it tells us specifically, there's a time frame here. It says from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. The sixth hour in our reckoning of time is noon. Twelve o'clock noon. The ninth hour then would have been three hours later, three o'clock in the afternoon. Typically, uh, three hours of the day where typically the sun's about at its brightest, right? The sun is shining, middle of the day. And this text says, when Jesus hung on the cross, there was darkness over all the land. Now, we're, we're coming up here in a very short uh, week or two, the solar eclipse, right? It's big current news right now, right? Uh, go and see the path of the solar eclipse. This is exciting stuff. And it is, right? Um, but even in those fascinating details of the solar eclipse, the, the earth will be darker, but there will not be utter darkness as this passage describes in the text. This text is meant to be reminiscent not of a some solar eclipse. This text is meant to remind us back to Exodus chapter 10. And, and it's what happens right around the original Passover. What was the ninth plague of the people coming out of Egypt? It was utter, it was darkness. Now what's interesting is in the original Passover of Exodus 10, the darkness was over much of the land, but there was light in Jerusalem. If you read back in Exodus 10, there's light in, Jeru in, in Jerusalem. There's light in, um, in where the Israelite camp was, but there's darkness around the, the people of Egypt. Now, what's interesting here is, is there a pocket of like those protected people, the people that are my righteous people? No, there's no protected pocket, right? There is all the land is dark. Jesus himself bears our sins. There's no light shining on Jesus in this moment. But it's reminiscent back to this darkness. And if you read Exodus 10, 21 through 23, you hear there's a, it's a darkness that was felt. It describes it this way. Of this, it's so dark you can feel it is kind of the language of Exodus 10. Utter loneliness that is experienced in a physical way here of just utterly, utterly alone. Darkness that can drive you mad, right? Darkness that was a clear display of sin is present and God is absent here in this text. The father turned his face away, removed his presence, if you will, from the sin-bearing Savior. And out of this darkness comes a cry, verse 46 of our text. Out of the darkness comes a cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And from, again, the language of the people present, the, the uh, people who were there, what do they do? These who are curious, they hear these words, and in the confusion of the darkness, they hear he's calling for Elijah. 
This Eli, my God, my God, they hear, maybe it's, is he saying Elijah? In the, the cry of Jesus here. And this, will Jesus call a powerful saint from the past to come and deliver him? Again, we see irony upon irony, right? Jesus doesn't need to be saved by some previous saint. What is his resurrection power going to do? His resurrection power is going to free the saints. We even see a glimpse of it here in our text before us. Matthew records this darkness and the mighty miracles that follow the, the temple uh, veil being ripped in two. And again, it's this, this, is a, this is a curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies in the temple. The holy of holies was where the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God rests on the Ark of the Covenant. And no one is allowed in there, right? This is this curtain that separates us from a holy God. What happens? This curtain, who in Exodus 26, <coughs> three different fabrics are woven together to make this thick curtain. It is ripped. And just to make sure you knew who did it, it's ripped from top to bottom, isn't it? This amazing display of clarity of darkness, clarity of the curtain, miracles upon miracles that are happening. It, it, it's clear in this text over and over again in an aspect of God's presence, his judgment of sin, his forgiveness and restoration is available through Jesus. And what do we have here? We have people that are like, I'm curious. I'm waiting around. Show me more. Show me more. Show me more. The heart that says, I, there, listen, it's okay to question and it's okay to be, be curious, but at some point you have to decide where you are. Perpetual curiosity is not what the text of scripture calls for. This group stayed curious, uncommitted, and it may describe people here today. It describes people all over the world. I'm curious about Jesus. If he did this, that, or the other thing, I might believe, but I got to keep seeing evidence upon evidence, upon evidence, and I will remain still uncommitted and still curious about him. The jury is still out with the curious here in this text. Now let me take you to the last group in our text, and that is those who honor King Jesus. Verse 54 uh, through 61, we'll read together. It says, Now when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went up to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Here in our text, we've moved from the mockery to the curious, and now to those who will honor the king. I will see him for who he really is, and I will worship him. I'm willing to risk in my following him and my believing in him. First, surprisingly, are the Roman guards here. Perhaps some of the very same people that were part of the mocking group in the beginning of our text, which is certainly encouraging for all of us in our life and our responses to King Jesus Here's, a, here's some who have perhaps turned from their wicked ways. Romans in the first century had an inscription on their coins. The inscription reads this way, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. My, my point in saying that is the only one called the son of God, the son of the divine, to a true Roman was who? It was Caesar. Caesar is the son of the divine, the son of God. Certainly, Roman soldiers, it was true of them, just like all Roman citizens. Who I see as the son of the divine, who my allegiance is with, is who? Their allegiance was to Caesar and to Rome. And here at our text, we have a surprising confession. The Roman guard, and it says, those who are with him, seems to be this group response 
to Jesus here as they witness these events. These guards, who perhaps a short time ago were mocking Jesus, they saw the earthquake. They experienced the darkness. They see the mighty miracles surrounding the death of Jesus like nothing they'd ever seen. These seasoned soldiers, they do what? They are reduced to great fear. And in this broken, humble state, what do they do? They're led to a confession, a mighty confession. Truly, this was the Son of God. They recognize the King for who he really is. They declare a very different statement of allegiance than to Tiberius, son of the divine. They say, say Jesus is the son of God. They honor him with this great confession. Secondly, in our text, we see the faithful women. Verse 55, verse 61, and we'll see perhaps if you're with us next week, chapter 28, verse 1. These women are present in three different episodes. Their names are mentioned throughout our text. They witness the death of Jesus. They witness where he's buried, and then they witness him rising again. Now, this doesn't stand out as odd to us, and I congratulate you on that. What I mean here is women being witnesses is like, okay, so what do you mean? And I will just try to give you just a quick moment to understand first century perspective. First century perspective. Like we live in a day where women can vote, women can be witnesses in court, equal rights under the law, and that was not at all the case in the first century. In fact, it's a pretty modern uh, experience for women in our day and age. Couple things here. First, names like this, including Simon of Cyrene, verse 32, Joseph of Arimathea, they act as footnotes in the scriptures. They're not just like, you know, giving you names. They're giving you names and where they're from and details about them. They're acting as footnotes first, helping us to understand the author's basically saying, if you don't believe me, go ask them. That's the idea of the text here. Here are footnotes to eyewitnesses that, uh, that were present during these events. Secondly, I would say this. The, the initial witnesses being predominantly women here uh, is remarkable, right? It's, it's women who bear witness to these three key events of Jesus in, in our text. Witnesses, women could not be witnesses in court. They did, put not, did not possess equal rights. In fact, I, I will just read to you very quickly a Greek philosopher named Celsus, who in the first century wrote these words. Who was high, he was highly opposed to Christianity. He wrote that Christianity can't be true because the written accounts of the resurrection are based on the, temp the testimony of women. And he writes, don't shoot the messenger. And we all know that women are hysterical. Christianity can't be true because women are the witnesses. Are you kidding me? Is what this Greek philosopher writes in his literature. I hope you see what this means, right? The gospel writers, if they were fabricating a story, it would be the stupidest thing ever to have women as your witnesses. And we see three times in this key passage, women being the witnesses of his death, of his burial, and of his resurrection. And, and I just submit to you, I hope you see what this means. The only possible reason for this is that they were really present and they reported what they saw. Bold women who were not hiding in fear like much of the men were doing in our context. Bold women who remained faithful and witnessed the work of Jesus on the cross, his burial place, and as we'll see in 28 verse 1 next week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Powerful uh, honor present in these, these women here. The third I'll mention here in the text mentions is Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph is a man who Matthew simply says here was a wealthy man. He was wealthy and he had become a follower of Jesus is what Matthew tells us here in our text. Mark's gospel points out that he was a part of the Sanhedrin, that key body of religious leaders, probably not welcomed into the midnight trial because he had sensitivity to Jesus, perhaps. Uh, he was a prominent member, Mark says, of the Sanhedrin, which helps us understand perhaps how he got an audience with the governor, Pilate himself, so quickly. 
John's gospel, not Mark's gospel says he's part of the Sanhedrin. John's gospel tells us he was a secret disciple. He believed, but he kind of, he wasn't made it known publicly. He wasn't bold enough to publicly profess faith in Jesus. And in one sense, we'd say, who would? Like, Jesus is being crucified. His followers are being dispersed. But what does he do in our text? In our text, he boldly goes before Pilate. In our text, he sacrificially gives up his new tomb that he's paid for being dug out of the side of the rock. And he honors Jesus. He risks much to honor him in our text. It is a bold move. Greater than his fear of being persecuted was his willingness to align himself, to declare his allegiance to Jesus in our text. He acts, and he does so boldly before Sabbath begins, as our text shows us. It's a response to the king of honor. And all these, right, the, the Roman guards, with their words, they profess it. With the women, what do they do? They follow faithfully their king. So the the, the Joseph of Arimathea, what does he do? He honors with action. He doesn't stay in hidden. He honors with action, bold action, to follow King Jesus and to honor him. Words and faithful following and action that is put on display. What does it mean to honor the king? Can I just say today, we have those three basic responses, each one in our day and age, mockery, curiosity, and honor that those are key ways that, that we respond to Jesus. And again, we're not merely meant to look at this text and walk away unchanged. We're meant to look at this text and see ourselves in this text, to consider our own hearts and what is our response to the king. If he is the king of kings, if he is the Lord of all lords, then curiosity and contempt and mockery are not fitting responses. If he is a liar or a lunatic, we would say, hey, that, that is a fitting response, right, about this Jesus. But if he is the king of kings and lord of all lords, if he is the son of God, as our text emphasizes before us, then there's a very different profound response of honor to him and our eternal destiny and the destiny of those around us. It matters how we respond to King Jesus. And I just ask you, what is your response to Jesus? Where do you see yourself in the text of Scripture that is before us? This day, this week that is in front of us is a perfect time to pause and consider with all honesty where your heart is. What do your words display? What do your actions display? What, who are you following? How does it display? Is Jesus your king or are you living completely with another allegiance? This text calls for us to declare our allegiance to King Jesus. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the great grace found in this passage. Truly, Lord, we see the love of God displayed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We see him surrounded not with those who are his friends and those who are faithful so much as we see mockery and contempt. And Lord, we thank you that the work of Jesus can change hearts. It can change hard hearts that now profess bold faith in Jesus. It can change the fearful into those who are followers and it can change those who are hiding to those who are openly and actively living for you. And so I just ask, Lord, that you would take the scripture, take this beautiful look into the work of Jesus on the cross, and would you cause us to see ourselves in the text? Would you help us, like Matthew does here, to see it through the perspective, through the eyes and through the lips of those who were present and active in this event, the crucifixion of Jesus? God, this week is a great week to pause and reflect. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to just get alone with you. I pray that if there's anyone here that's ready to respond, that you give them boldness to respond with faith. Take a book, booklet in the, in the back or come talk to me or somebody else and just, Lord, give their heart in submission to the King of kings and Lord of all lords. We thank you for the grace and the love found in this passage and 
in the middle of the darkness, the amazing light of the gospel, the good news of Jesus being on display. We thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.